talking about things coming out in September. I, myself, and Nicole, this is Miranda, and that is Patrick, and we will be talking about the exciting things being published in September. So we'd like to start out with talking about some more well-known authors and more titles to get you excited about them, but we go a little quicker over these now. So Stephen King, hopefully I'm saying that right, has a new one coming out, Fairy Tale. It's going to be a fantasy novel about Charlie, a high school kid who loses his mom. One day he's following his dog. His dog takes him to a noisy locked shed. The neighbor who the shed belongs to lets Charlie do some odd jobs and some yard work until one day Charlie finds out what's in that shed. It's a portal to another world. Okay, spoiler alert. That's all the jacket though. Next we have Helen Back. Number 18 in the Walter Longmire series from Craig Johnson. Perhaps you've heard of him as well. One of our library faves. This one sounds really dark, though. I haven't read all of Walt Longmire's work, but this one sounds very dark. Walt is going to wake up in Fort Pratt in Montana, and he cannot remember where he is, how he got there, or even his name. His shirt says Walt Longmire, and that's what he has to start with. So for a dark term, check out To Hell and Back. We have uh, number 23 in the number one ladies detective agency. I'm not familiar with this one, so hopefully this means a little more to you, but the notes say Grace's husband is in trouble and a family friend helps them come up with an advertising campaign to help out. Grace and her husband need to help uh, the child of a family friend sort through a mysterious matter as well. So after that, James Patterson has his fourth um, collaboration with Brandon Bois. This one's about U.S. President Keegan Barrett, who orders the CIA on a secret revenge-sounding mission. It starts to sound very personally motivated, so the CIA agents are torn on how to proceed and what to do. Next up, we have the third in the Murder Mystery Club series, Richard Osman. Now, I think some of you have read this before. The first one is being turned into a Steven Spielberg movie, so that was the hot guess if I caught. This one's going to put Elizabeth in the hot seat of a cold case killer. And can the septuagenarian, how do you say it, Septuagen septuagenarian sleuths figure out who done it before the murderer strikes again? Nicholas Sparks is going to explore Dreamland. A young couple from different walks of life connect over their passion for music. There's going to be a young mother as well struggling on her own. And the three of them will meet up and will have a life-changing weekend together in Dreamland. Treasure State by C.J. Box is number six in the Cassie DeWell series. And Treasure State um, inspired the Big Sky series on ABC that came out recently. Uh, Inspector Investigator Cassie is going to head to Anaconda, Montana, hot on the trail of a wealthy con man. And finally, another library favorite, uh, Frederick Bachman's The Winners, is going to be the final piece to his Bear Town series. The small hockey town residents are going to deal with change and pain and hope and redemption after a big storm blows into town. Okay, so some really exciting ones coming out in September. We have a lot of great nonfiction as well. I think you will all be interested in the first one. Um, the author is known for writing mystery and nonfiction, so he's going to combine his two interests for this Cleveland story of Elliot Ness. Mm -hmm. Elliot Ness, who was tasked with solving the gruesome plot some crimes that took place in the 1930s in Cleveland. We get to see and follow this battle of wits and a local hero and a madman. I think a lot of us too are into um, historical president um, kind of biographies. So check out this next one, Become FDR. Um, Darman is known for landslide, landslide of President Johnson and Ronald Reagan at the dawn of New America was his previous one that was well reviewed. He's a political correspondent and journalist with a Harvard pedigree. And so his latest, he'll get to know FDR and his struggles that helped him become the, the man that he was. Does that sound okay? I feel like I'm butchering it because I'm rushing. Okay. Agatha Christie, we're already talking about that one over here. And yes, Worsley has written about Jane Austen, Queen Victoria, Kensington Palace. And now she's taking on Agatha Christie, an exploration of her personal letters to explore why she maybe presented herself as a boring lady of leisure when she had so much more going on in her life that we want to learn more about. Number four, Prisoners of the Castle. This one's very hard to read on the screen. The subtitle is an epic story of survival and escape from Kolditz, the Nazi's fortress prison. This is the definitive and surprising story of one of history's most notorious prisons and the remarkable POWs who tried endlessly to escape their captors. 
this one sounds really exciting. Uh, the castle held the most defiant allied prisoners. And uh, the author is known for the spy and the traitor and Operation Mincemeat, among others. I've written about this before. Is that good place in Germany? Or? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's where they held the allied captive prisoners. And at that, the ones that kept trying to escape, they put them all together thinking that they could control them easier. Guess what? They were just more ingenious and more uh, determined to get out. So I can't wait to read that for myself. The Storm is Here, an American Crucible. So this one, the author has worked years in reporting on the war of terrorism abroad. Then 2020 happened and he was forced to return home. And he used this time to start reporting on social discord in the pandemic. And he um, was in Washington, D.C. on January 6th, and he followed the mob into the Senate chambers. He shares his own personal experience that day and reflects on his reporting of the larger story at hand there. That'll be an interesting, interesting account. A Man of Iron, the Turbulent Life and Improbable Presidency of Grover Cleveland is a well-researched biography of Grover Cleveland. From his personality to his career, everything is explored in this compelling new book. And Starry Messenger, of course, we all love Neil deGrasse Tyson. This is gonna be his newest work. Um, he reflects when our political and cultural views feel more polarized than ever. Tyson's gonna share with us with warmth and eloquence how precious life is and how magic the earth is. And last but not least, by hands know now, Jim Crow's Legal Executioners by Margaret A. Burnham. She is the director of Northeastern University's Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project. She's gonna shed some light on the criminal legal system exploring from the 1920s to the 60s to show the long reach of slavery today and the legal processes. Okay, a lot of hot titles to get you on hold for. First up. For you. Well, I could hold on to it if you'd like. We'll work on our hands and that. I survived you by Jonathan Escoffrey. This one's a debut novel. Well, it actually is a collection of linked short stories about a Jamaican American family in 1970s Miami. Uh, the main narrator is named Trelawney. He's the younger of two sons and he's struggling to figure out his identity as a light skinned Jamaican American. Uh, the book is being described as both humorous and harrowing and sharp and inventive that explores themes like racism, poverty, cultural identity, and belonging. A couple of read-alikes uh, would be Everything You Don't Belong, Everywhere You Don't Belong by Gabriel Bump. Uh, this one's a coming-of-age story described as both witty and heartbreaking about a black boy growing up um, on the south side of Chicago. And then Members Only is um, about an Indian American who was ostracized from his beloved country club for making a racist joke. Uh, this is from the publisher. Heartfelt, humorous, and hard-hitting, members only explores what membership and belonging mean as Raj, the main character, navigates the complicated space between black and white America. That works. So I'm gonna be up here for a while. <laughs> Forgive me if, if it goes badly. Let's see. Lucrenzia de Medici. It's set in uh, Renaissance Florence around the 1550s. We find her the third daughter of the Florentine Grand Duke. As the third daughter, she is mercifully out of the spotlight and enjoys a certain amount of freedom within the court. However, this all changes when her older sister dies on the eve of her wedding a wedding that would cement an alliance, um, and Lucrenza has to take her place. Full of drama and lively characters, the world of Renaissance Florence is brilliantly brought to life as um, Farrell uh, paints the portrait of a resilient young woman battling for survival. So that's the book that's coming out. Uh, 
my two read-alikes is this first one is a fiction titled Madam Serpent. Uh, Captain Yuichi <coughs> novel is the first in a series uh, set in a similar time period and about the same family. It is about Catherine, who is 14 and arriving <coughs> in France to marry Henri uh, de Orleans, the second son of the King of France. Um, amid the glittering banquets and, most, and the most decadent uh, court in 16th century Europe, the reluctant bride becomes a passionate but unwanted wife, causing her to take matters into her own hands. Uh, with a fiery protagonist and vivid detail and a plot full of intrigue, twists, and turns, there's a lot to explore in this 16th century drama. And in case you didn't know, Catherine de Medici was a real person, and her story is fascinating, as are all of her family members, which is why I have my second read-alike here, which is Florence and the Medici um, by uh, Hale. It is the comprehensive story of the Medici banking family as individuals and their collective legacy, and how they became one of the most impactful families in history. They came to prominence, um, kind of inventing part of our modern banking system to this day, and exerted extraordinary control over Florence and the surrounding areas, including up to the papacy. Um, and it is an inspiration if you are, if any of you are familiar with the term Machiavellian or the prince, the Medici family is what inspired um, Machiavelli to write The Prince, so just a fascinating family. Um, by Abidare. 
It, with a similar focus on the experience of Nigerian women, it is an inspiring and unforgettable story of a teenage girl, Adini, oh, uh, growing up in rural Nigeria in a rural Nigerian village with, who longs for an education, heartbreaking and triumphant. We follow her journey and to find her own voice as she mounts insurmount, as she mounts insurmountable odds and obstacles in her path to reaching her goals maybe changing the world, a thought-provoking and beautifully written story of courage um, from a
brother is seven, there's an accident, and their little brother goes missing. The missing boy, of course, devastates the family and the community, and the author immerses us in their world. Cassandra questions again and again, what happened? What could have happened differently? What could have been? And in the second half of the book, she's going to meet a different Wayne, who also shared that family loss experience. It's going to be gut-wrenching and eloquent. A read like while you're waiting on the new shelf would be Our Little World by Karen Wynn. This is also a tale of what can happen to devastated community when something tragic strikes. Next up, I have Children of the Catastrophe. This is going to be the second novel for Miss Shoemaker. This is her first, Mr. Rochester, who does indeed explore Mr. Rochester from Bronte's Jane Eyre. Thank you. Uh, the author interestingly said that she wants to write books that she wants to read. So she's, you know, following that Jane Eyre story. And in this story, she's exploring what happened in the Mediterranean during World War I. Um, it takes place, starts in 1908 in Greece with an arranged marriage being planned. So you get to see the wedding and the young couple and their kids starting to build their life together, and it's torn apart by World War I. There's a massacre of Greeks and Armenians, and the young family's going to struggle to survive and to keep together. The story is said to be rich in historical details and deeply engaging with themes of love and survival, much like the characters in Anita Shreve's Stella Bain and Thomas Canale's The Daughter of Mars will also explore this same time period, family survival, and what can happen to your family. Seventeenth century New England, Act of Oblivion is an imagined retelling of the search for two Englishmen involved in the killing of King Charles I. So the historical context is this: at the end of the English Civil War between the Parliamentarians and the Royalists, uh, King Charles I was executed by the Parliamentarian victors. This was in 1649. Ten years later, the royalists returned to power, and they began to execute the men who executed Charles. <laughs> so two of these wanted men and their dogged pursuer are the book's main characters. So you've got themes of religion, vengeance, and power. If you are interested in that little chapter of history, you might want to check out this nonfiction book called Killers of the King. Subtitle is The Men Who Dared to Execute Charles I by Charles Spencer. So this is an account of the 59 men who signed King Charles's death certificate, uh, death warrant rather. And then uh, I was searching for any other book that might take place in that same time period, and I found this one, Rebels and Traitors, by Lindsay Davis. Um, so this does take place during the English Civil War, but it's more of a love story uh, about two people on opposite sides of the country. She's just arrived in post-war Paris uh, to begin her junior year abroad. She's 20 years old, socially poised, but financially precarious and all too aware of her mother's expectations. Um, set against the backdrop of recovering uh, France, Jacqueline in Paris is an evocative, sensitive, and richly detailed story that portrays the origin story of an American icon before we knew her as First read alike is Jackie and Me by Louis Baynard, uh, set just shortly thereafter in 1951. Jackie 
Bouvier, thank you, um, is working hard as an inquiry camera girl for a Washington newspaper. Um, her goal in life is to not be a housewife, but this, reserva but this goal uh, falters after she meets a dashing young congressman by the name of Jack. From the perspective of her best friend and confidant, um, Lem, Jackie and me gives a fresh look at an iconic couple and the story of friendship, love, sacrifice, and one of the most well-known first ladies. And so my final read of life is actually Jacqueline Beauvais Kennedy Onassis. It is the untold, her untold story is a biography, so it is a nonfiction title that goes into her real life, getting to know the real Jackie in this well-researched biography that blends both fact and narrative storytelling to an open that allows you to open a window into her world and what her life was like from her youth to the shocking events in 1963 and its effect on her life thereafter. Shrines of Gaiety by Kate Atkinson is set in London, 1920, or 1926. We find ourselves in a country still recovering from the crucible of the Great War. Um, a delicious new nightlife has arisen in London at the clubs of Soho. It is the place where peers of the realm rub shoulders with starlets, born dignitaries, gangsters, and girls selling dances for a shilling. Our protagonist and queen of this glittering new world is Nellie Coker, uh, the ruthless and ambitious mother of six, one of whom has returned from the war. Beneath the gaiety, there is a dark underbelly with a, with a uniquely Dickensian flair, sly wit, and a clever plotting. The story offers a window into that vanishing underworld. Um, my first real life for this is The Light Between the Oceans, a novel by M.L. Stedman with a similar theme of coping with life after the First World War and building a family. Our protagonist is Tom Shearborn, who has returned to Australia in 1926 after serving on the Western Front. Forever changed by his experience, he takes a job as a lighthouse keeper and eventually marries Isabel, hoping to start a family. After several painful years of miscarriages and one stillbirth, the grieving couple have all but given hope until a, bot, a boat with a dead man and a live baby wash up on shore. With this beautifully detailed and with beautiful detail and unique characters, this thought-provoking and chilling tale will make you consider how far you would go for family. The other read alike I have um, also set <coughs> in London during this period is the Paying Guest by Sarah Waters. Um, Ex-servicemen are delusioned, the out of work are hungry and demanding change. A genteel villa devoid of men is about to change forever as its impoverished owners must take in the lodgers to make ends meet. With rich detail and a melancholy tone, you will find yourself transported to the interwar period. while you're waiting for where the crawdad sings. <laughs> so maybe check this out, maybe you'll get that before if you're waiting for that one. They're both gonna take place in the swamplands and explore a lot of family themes. Main character Lonnie has her dream job as an ornithological illustrator for the Smithsonian. Main character Lonnie is raised in a small Florida community on the Panhandle and got out of there as soon as possible. Years later, her mother falls ill and she's forced to come home and deal with her mother. Her brother has put her mother in the nursing home and they're going through the house belongings trying to get her affairs in order. Uh, Lonnie's father died when Lonnie was 12 and it was an unsolved, mysterious circumstance kind of happening. And they find something interesting while 
they're going through the house that maybe is a clue to her father's uh, mysterious death. So, we'll have to see what, what trouble Lonnie gets into. I'm going to go out on a limb and speculate that maybe Ruth was involved, and I think that makes for an interesting story. Other read-alikes for family mysteries, drama, relationships is Call Your Daughter Home and The Lost Kings, and this one's on the new shelf. This one is more if you like that marshland setting and you want to read those southern, you know, themes and atmosphere, and this is a mother-daughter relationship as well, and this is more of the mystery part of the Marsh Queen. What goes on inside a family can really shock us. So next up, All That's Left Unsaid. This is a debut novel. It's going to be set in 1990s Australia. So what happens here is a young boy is graduating high school and he asks his family to go out on the town celebrate with his friends, of course, and he is violently murdered late night in a diner. And so the family is reeling. Why did we let him go? What could have gone differently? They want answers. They want to know what happened, who did it, and why. Despite it taking place in a, uh, a, a restaurant, there were several witnesses, the police do not know who did it, what happened, or why. They're very frustrated, and his sister Kai is going to uncover the truth and track down the witnesses herself. Everything she uncovers paints a bigger story about what's going on outside of just her brother being involved, and she needs to figure out what happens to put her family at peace. This is a heart-pounding mystery with well-written characters and gripping suspense. I pulled Celeste Ning because she writes about families with a little bit of what's going on here, how can we repair, what's going to happen next. And I read this one last year, The Dinner, with Herman Conk, Koch, Koch, Coke, one of them. Pepsi. Herman, you know, Herman Pepsi. Um, the, whatever I didn't say is I'm sure how you said it. Um, so the dinner is a family goes to dinner together and they start having this conversation and something really strange happened with their sons together and now they have to unpack that and react and figure out what to do next since their sons, sons are criminals now. Next, the house party. and daughters-in-law, and how it can be complex to say the least. 
story focuses on three women who married into, into the Tobias family, Veronica, the family matriarch, her daughter-in-law, Mel, and Mel's daughter-in-law, Birdie, a recent addition to the family. A sharply funny and big-hearted multi-generational story that examines the roles women play in holding the family together as told by those who married into that family. Um, my first read alike is Little Fires Everywhere because that's a similar to the family. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. It's a story of groups of families and the shenanigans that they can get into. Um, my next read alike is They May Not Mean To, But They Do by Catherine Schneel. Um, it's a similar focus on familial relationships. This is a tender, sometimes hilarious, intergenerational story about the search for where you belong as your family. Joy Bergman is not slipping into old age with the quiet grace that her children Molly and Daniel would prefer, stubbornly refusing to take her meds or any advice. Joy and her husband Eric have lasted through health, dementia, and some lousy business decisions, so thus they are fine. However, this all changes when Eric passes away. But the Bergman family has always stuck together, so hopefully things will turn out for the best. With sympathy, humor, and um, this story explores the intrusion of old age into a large and loving family. But really, you should read this book. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Do you want me to leave it up there for you? If we read it, you guys promise to stop me. <laughs> Maybe we'll bring it next month, too. <laughs> At least one of us will. <laughs> So I've got This Old Place, the debut for Bobby Finger. Finger is a New York-based journalist and podcaster. It's gonna take place in a small Texas town known as Billington, where gossip is currency. So Mary Alice Roth has been the subject of her fair share of it. Mary Alice is described as a jigsaw puzzle of a character. She comes across as really off-putting and intimidating, but there's more to her story than meets the eye, and readers will get to know the small town and what's actually going on with Mary Alice. Uh, for read-alikes with quirky, unpredictable characters, I picked Eleanor Oliphant, is completely fine, and also this How Lucky one that has a quirky uh, man who is bound to a wheelchair, and he tries to solve a mystery of what's happening outside his window, and I really enjoyed both of these. So hopefully this old place, or the old place, will not disappoint when it comes out. Lori R. King, I think we're familiar with her. She's a great mystery writer. She's got a new one coming out. This is a standalone. Uh, she's got a style like Anne Cleves, and this storyline reminded me of The Catch. So I'll talk about the storyline real quick. It's gonna explore a 50-year-old cold case in California. The Garner Estates is a famed location with a beautiful house and a well-groomed yard and a mysterious family that takes up residence there. Construction workers working on a project to improve, you know, the yard, find a skull that looks like it's been buried for 50 years. So main character investigator Rachel is going to explore the estate to try and find some clues. And she gets to know the family a little more and what's going on there. And she's going to connect it to a local serial kill killing spree that has gone unsolved. So more mystery seems to be appearing quicker than the answers. And so the catch is also about a family mystery, who done it and what's gonna happen. Family secrets getting out. And this is on the new shelf as well. Oh, we've got Andy, sorry, yeah, do this one up there. <laughs> Start with the first in the 
the series, that's this one here, The Crow Trap. And this one, uh, three women who are completing an environmental survey at the National Park have their project interrupted by both a suicide and a murder. And you might also try Louise Penny's Inspector Gamache series, this first one in the series, Still Life. Um, so the series, this is a popular series, takes place in a small village, small fictional village in uh, modern day Canada. And in the first book, you have Inspector Gamache and his team investigating the death of a local school teacher and amateur artist who has been struck dead in the woods by a hunting I'm sure it was an accident. <laughs> Next we have Murder on the Vine. This one is the third in a series, the Tuscan Mystery Series. It is set in the Tuscan countryside and features retired homicide detective Nico Doyle. So Doyle is a former New York City homicide detective who has moved to his late wife's hometown, Tuscany, uh, in retirement and finds himself being consulted uh, for his crime-solving expertise. So in this latest book, an 80-year-old local bartender has gone missing. When Nico responds to a call for help from a friend having car trouble, the body turns up in the friend's truck. This one, as uh, Kirkus describes, has a cool, colorful cozy with a decidedly Italian flavor. I'll also, if you're a fan of dogs, I guess Nico has a canine sidekick, so. Here's the first, oh wait, no. Yeah, that's right. First in the series is Murder in Chianti. Uh, so you get to meet Nico, he's grieving the loss of his wife. Uh, when he's pulled into a local murder investigation after finding a dead body in the woods near his cabin. And you, all, you might also try this Chief uh, Bruno series by Mark Walker. Uh, features uh, Captain Bruno, who's a peaceful, food-loving detective in small town France. Mother, daughter, traitor, spy. Is a standalone from this author who usually writes this Maggie Pope series. And what I found most interesting about this new novel is that when she was researching the Hollywood spy, she happened across this real story that inspired both of these novels. Like she wrote about it in her Maggie Pope series and then she wanted to expand on it in her next novel. So what's going on here is Los Angeles, 1940s. Uh, Mother-daughter moved there to start fresh. Daughter Victoria quick, quickly realizes her new boss is a bitter anti-Semite, helping to recruit Nazis in the U.S. She takes her uh, her story, her info, her clues to the FBI, who dismiss her, say, "Get out of here, young lady," and uh, say it's not enough. And she's, you know, she's a girl. She's crazy. And so Veronica and her mother end up going to investigate this on their own. They get help from Ari Lewis, the city's anti-Nazi spy master. So that one will be really exciting. I like that it's kind of based in fact on the mother-daughter investigating Nazis and uh, the author says that she really only fictionalized the backstories and the small details for fun. So maybe check out The Hollywood Spy while you're waiting. And it's also, it reminded me of Jacqueline Winspear, um, you know, timing, female, strong character, mysterious things going on there. So hopefully that'll be a great one. Archie Mayer's got a new one out. This is number 33 in his Joe Gunther series. While you're waiting, you can catch up on read likes like C.J. Box, David Baldacci. You can read the previous one in the series, which is called Dark Command, which is here if you need to catch up. In this one, a fancy car is stolen in Vermont, and it's recovered, and Joe Gunther is called to investigate. There's a body in the trunk. The case gets even more complicated as it's crossed state lines, and it's got a lot of other things in it. It's got a lot of stolen goods. It's got these um, stolen cell phones, and eventually the cell phones are connected to cases of children going missing. So 
Hand Joe Gunther figured out in time uh, before more bodies start to pop up in Fall Guy. Series here. This is the ninth book in the Department Q series, and it's been. It's uh, it, they say it's the penultimate book, so I guess they're going to wrap it up one more book after this one. Uh, Department Q is Copenhagen's Cold Case Division, so this one is actually translated from the Danish. Um, this latest installment takes place in Denmark during the COVID nineteen restrictions. The Department Q team discover links between a series of accidental deaths that have occurred every two years for three decades, and they must race to find the killer before he strikes again. Uh, the first one in the series is the Keep Keeper of Lost Causes. Uh, Chief Detective Carl Mork, recovering from what he thought was a career-destroying gunshot wound, is relegated to cold cases and becomes immersed in the five-year disappearance of a politician. So if you want to start at the beginning, this is the one for you. Uh, fans of Adler Olson might also enjoy Christopher Fowler, who's known for his uh, historical mystery series, Bryant and May. Um, what's that? They're great. Okay. Uh, this first book in the series alternates back and forth between modern day London and London during the Blitz. So check that out. Look how we got the next one. Yeah. Killers of a certain age. So Deanna Rayborn is known for her historical novels. So she's departing from that with this novel. This is uh, a rollicking action-packed thriller. We have a group of 60-year-old female assassins who are targeted for termination <laughs> right after their retirement. And they have to use their extensive training and old-school skills to fight against the organization, they, organization they've given 40 years of their lives to. I think we can all relate. <laughs> <laughs> if that sounds good, uh, you could also check out uh, Helene Turston's books. Uh, her first one is called An Elderly Lady is Up to No Good. Uh, we only have that in ebook form, but we also have this short story uh, collection about the same character. So this is a kind of a funny and irreverent story collection about an 88 year old Swedish woman who uses murder to maintain her preferred mode of living. <laughs> now you might also like Richard Osmond's The Thursday Murder Club. Um, it's a funny, cozy mystery that features four septuagenarian salutes. Septu septuagenarian. Septu 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 uh, investigating unsolved crimes. Seven year old people. <laughs> it's not as fun to say that. <laughs> it's like a six dollar word right there. The Butcher and the Wren is a debut novel, and this Elena author is the co-host of Morbid, a true crime podcast, and she's an autopsy technician with degrees in criminal justice, psychology, and biology. So that, to me, is a very interesting background to write in murder mystery. There's a methodical killer who is interested in medical experimentation on the victims, lurking in the Louisiana bayou, taunting the authorities, it seems. And Dr. Wren, which of the Wren, Wren's gonna be the investigator. Dr. Wren is the best forensic pathologist with years of experience, and she's being called upon to participate in this gruesome game of cat and mouse. It's described as dark and tense with pulse County mystery and great attention to detail. I bet too detailed for my liking. Sounds a little gory, but sounds really interesting too. These are some read-alikes if you like a violent, darker, cat and mouse type mystery to keep you going. Uh, some Lisa Black, and this is off the new shelf, The Binding Room. The next one as well, Ted Kill. This author, Shannon Kirk, this is not her first. 
but she also has a very interesting background for the novels she's written. Shannon Kirk is a practicing attorney and law professor, which will be featured in her book, Ten Hill. Main character Greta Serville finds herself on the run from her own law firm. She's been authorized to investigate suspected corruption in her law firm, possible high crimes. And so she takes the data, the information, the clues she has, and she needs to go off the grid because almost right away she feels threatened and she feels like she's being pursued by the people she's investigating. She's got an interesting cast of characters to help her along the way. And we need to find out if she's gonna to get to the bottom of it and what to do with what she finds out. It's a legal thriller for fans of Fiona Barton and Harlan Coben. as only honorable mentions or novelty. 
gives the continent its due, telling stories of great Africans and the, how their cultures interacted with those around the world. Really, really interesting book. Um, the next one is Africa, A Biography of a Continent by John Green. It is an immersive, thought-provoking, and thoroughly researched book that tells the story of the continent that gave birth to humanity. Uh, to up through modern times. With breathtaking scope, this book covers African geology, uh, geology, evolution, as well as the rich diversity of people and cultures. Written in an elegant but accessible prose and illustrated with the author's own photographs from his trips there. This is an unforgettable book for all.
and all the people who have come before it, its mythos, and in our general culture. Um, it extends from the Pleistocene age to the 21st century. And then finally, The World as We Knew It. This is a riveting anthology from 19 leading literary writers reflecting on how climate change has altered their lives, revealing the personal and haunting consequences of this global threat as the stories unfold from Antarctica, Australia, New Hampshire to New York, an intimate portrait of climate change as the climate change world emerges. I believe that is it for our books coming out in September. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it too. If you could join us for um, our book discussions, the next one is Animal Vegetable Junk. Uh, History of Food from Sustainable to Suicidal by Mark Pittman, and The Italian Teacher, a novel by Tom.